moving on to this presentation, I have three things I hope to share with you. And I share the uh, interest of the previous speakers in the idea of research, and probably even more important, is the idea of the respect for physiotherapy and what we can do for the health uh, and well-being of people. Uh, my conflict of interest statement is that um, I only receive royalties from my first book, not from the second book. I want to talk in part about the low back and the hip because I am still seeing patients and still practicing. And I find one of the most interesting things is deciding when someone has pain in the hip area, is it from the back, is it from the hip, is it both, and how do they interact? The picture of the young woman on your right is an individual who has low back pain. I would think looking at her posture, it has to be very clear she ought to have low back pain because of the severe extension that she's in. She acquired this by being a gymnast and not developing her muscles appropriately. So this is uh, just a little diagram, and I know all of you in practice would recognize that there are a variety of reasons to have pain in the areas that I've shown on those slides. And again, is it from the back? Is it from the hip? Or what combination? I have uh, examples here that we're going to talk about sort of muscular factors of the hip as well as uh, joint factors that affect back movement. In the video on your left, this woman has low back pain, and if you see her walking, and particularly from the back view, you can see she has excessive lumbo-pelvic rotation. That kind of walk will give you back pain because it's injuring the discs in the back when you rotate too much. The woman below also came in in a wheelchair because of her back pain, but I am sure that any physio watching her walk can see that it's her hips that don't move and that in fact she has degenerative hip joint disease, which is what's destroying her back. The young woman I've already pointed out that is in extension. And then over on your far right is a young man sitting in lumbar flexion because his back muscles are too stretched out and he cannot sit up straight. So how does the hip contribute? Muscular factors. If your hip extensors are somewhat stiff or short, it'll contribute to lumbar flexion. If your hip flexors do not elongate readily enough, you'll have lumbar extension. And if your hip rotators, like the tensor fasciolata iliotibial band, is stiff and doesn't extend, you can get lumbar rotation problems, like the woman that I showed you with excessive lumbo-pelvic rotation. And the structural factors that we'll talk about are femoral anti or retroversion, which will give you lumbar rotation. And then the structural variations they're identifying in the hip, called CAM, are pincer impingement problems. Those particular problems of the hip will contribute to lumbar flexion. And then as the other woman that I showed you illustrates that if you have degenerative hip joint disease, your back will both extend too easily as well as rotate too easily. So the specifics are that restricting motion in a specific direction will happen if the back at the hip and the back will compensate. Now, one of the major factors, and this is an insight that I'd like to share with you, is that there's a factor called relative stiffness or an impairment of the hip. And the stiffness of the impairment of the hip contributes to movements of the back in a specific direction. The exam that we use to examine for low back syndromes includes an assessment of the movement of the back itself, 
the hip and how the hip affects the back. This exam is to determine the low back syndrome. And this is my other major factor. I, I want to make the point very strongly that physios need to describe syndromes that will be the diagnosis of the conditions that we address. And in this particular system, the syndrome is named for the movement direction causing pain. And as I've been stating, the contributing factors are impaired hip motions as well as a deviation in the motion of the back itself are when there's poor control of the back or the trunk. Just to show you a nice relationship between these movement system syndromes, and we'll talk about the movement system, and pathoanatomical conditions, that herniated discs are most often associated with flexion problems of the back. And they occur in young people who are often tall and because they are flexible. This is usually associated with a very acute pain problem. If you have a spondylotype problem or a stenosis problem, it's usually associated with lumbar extension. And that usually means you're old, short, probably stiff, and the condition is usually chronic. The rotation component can occur with all of the above, as well as both flexion and extension. So what about this movement system that I think is so important for us as physios? It's actually a physiological system of the body. It has dysfunctions or impairments that we should be diagnosing. And the development and maintenance of this system should be guided by the physiotherapist. I believe that we should be birth to death practitioners, guiding the development of how people move from the time they're born until they can't move anymore, just as the dentist follows what happens to the teeth from the time you get them until you can't use them anymore. The movement system, by definition, is a physiological system that functions to produce motion of the body as a whole or of the component parts, the functional interactions of structures that contribute to the act of moving. I believe that this definition is very good because it applies to all levels of the organism, whether it's how insulin goes through membranes, or how neurons are recruited, or how man moves in his environment. It gives us a focus, but it yet it doesn't restrict us in the level of interest. And this is a diagram of the movement system. It, of course, as you know from, from your studies and from your practice, consists of the skeletal system, the muscular system, and the nervous system. And the interface between all of these systems is biomechanics, because they all produce movement. Also, the metabolic and pulmonary and cardiovascular systems are necessary for the health and viability of these other systems, but they are also affected by movement. In the United States, we're doing the great experiment of testing the metabolic system to see how much we can eat and how little we can move and still live. <laughs> Biomechanical mechanisms. Why the hip affects the lumbopelvic area. And, and I often say this uh, statement because uh, if somebody said to me, Shirley, what's the most important thing you've identified in your 50 odd years of practicing? I'd say it's that the body takes the path of least resistance for movement. It hurts where it moves, and it moves where it's the easiest to move. And one of the contributing factors is what I call relative flexibility or relative stiffness. And the definition of relative stiffness is that given two springs in series of different degrees of stiffness, and stiffness is defined as the change in tension per unit change in length. When tension is applied to these springs, the least stiff spring will elongate. So given a flexible spine and differences in the stiffness of the musculature, you'll move at the site that is the easiest to move, are the most flexible. So 
And the reason why there's a change in the stiffness of different muscles is because of the repeated movements and prolonged postures of everyday activities as well as sport. So a joint becomes more flexible than other contiguous joints. One, because of decreased di disc thickness or ligamentum laxity. It'll move more readily in a specific direction. And as mentioned, some of the muscles attaching to that joint are stiffer than other muscles attaching to that joint. Here's an example of optimal relative stiffness. In this young man, his back is not very flexible, and he has <clears throat> very good abdominals, as depicted by these tight springs. What's more extensible is his rectus femoris, so that when he bends his knee, nothing happens. The rectus femoris elongates. Here's an example of impaired stiffness. His back is flexible, his abdominals are not very stiff, so that when he flexes his knee, the rectus femoris does not elongate, I mean, it, it easily without pulling on the pelvis, causing it to anteriorly tilt. This kind of behavior results in a lumbar extension or a lumbar extension rotation syndrome. So here's a video example of an individual who has low back pain. In fact, it's the woman that you saw walking uh, very first. And you'll see that when I passively flex her knee, her pelvis not only anteriorly tilts, it rotates. And the pelvis rotates because of the stretch across the tensor fasciolata iliotibial band. And you'll see that when I flex her left knee, it rotates even more than it did with the right knee. So her back is becoming mobilized with every movement of her lower extremity. So in this system, the movement system syndrome, there, of syndromes, there are assumptions. One, that low back pain is associated with movement in a specific direction, that we can identify subgroups, that it's the repeated movements and prolonged postures that cause a joint to develop a susceptibility to movement in a specific direction, that it induces tissue changes that contribute to this relative flexibility, all because the body takes the path of least resistance for movement. Additional assumptions are that the tissue changes include the nervous system, muscular system, and skeletal system, and their biomechanical interactions. And the major theory that we're testing, and I think, and we are getting evidence, as I'll share with you, is that this DSM, directional susceptibility to movement, is basically the accessory motion hypermobility. The accessory motion hypermobility is the big cause of tissue injury and degeneration. The other thing that I think we have to have society appreciate is that musculoskeletal pain is a progressive condition associated with degenerative changes that we all undergo and that's affected by lifestyle. In this system, the syndrome, as I mentioned, is named for the movement direction that most consistently causes symptoms. And when you correct the movement, the symptoms are either decreased or completely eliminated. The contributing factors are alterations in the kinesiology of the movement and how hip motions cause the spine to move. Similarly, trunk alignments and motions are now abnormal rather than ideal, and the control mechanisms of the lumbopelvic region are also abnormal. The syndromes are very simple, and these are the names. Extension, extension rotation, flexion, flexion rotation, and rotation. Why do we classify them? Number one is, I am totally convinced that no one will ever think we figure anything out if we don't put a label on it. We need to identify the different contributing factors for each one of the syndromes. The treatment is different for the syndromes, and it's the only way we can really address prevention and treatment in a manner of efficiency. Here's a little chart just to make the point with you. If you have 
an extension syndrome, It'll, you're probably old, short, or it's a chronic condition. If you have a flexion syndrome, you're young, tall, and probably have an acute problem. If you have a rotation syndrome, that can be a component in all of these patients. If you have a rotation syndrome, your oblique abdominal muscles probably have poor control. Extension, abdominals are poor, but in the flexion patient, they can be too good. They can contribute to the problem because the abdominals are so good. Your back extensors are probably good in a rotation problem, good in extension problem, but poor in a flexion problem. Your hip flexor rotators, short or stiff with rotation or extension, but good and probably long in the flexion patient. Your hip extensors, stiff, good, long in the extension patient and the rotation patient, but in the flexion patient, bad. Your activities probably require rotation like sports or job. In the extension patient, you'll sit in extension or when you return from forward bending, you'll extend your spine before you extend your hip. If you have a flexion problem, you will sit in flexion. You can see with just this lineup that the interventions are very different for these types of patients. Also, the, the idea here is that if you have this young looking spine when you start off, we want to prevent it from looking old and degenerated. And how important and how difficult is it is shown on this next slide. In over a thousand people where their spines were examined between 18 and 55 years of age, there were all these changes, 40% of those under 30 years of age had degenerative disc indications. 90% of the people had changes in the spine by the time they were 50 to 55. And that there's a high correlation between the amount of degeneration and the low back pain. And as you know from your practices, the most affected segments are L5, S1, L4, L5. So what is our strategy for prevention? It's to stop the motion at joints that have limited range of motion, particularly stop the rotation, and ensure precise motion at joints that have a lot of range of motion. What you really need to stop is accessory motion hypermobility. And I put this chart up just to make the point that we only have one to two degrees of rotation at each lumbar segment except for L5-S1. It shouldn't rotate because it destroys it. In this young woman that I showed you standing in the exaggerated extended position, I just had to have her contract her abdominal muscles and that would take her out of pain and correct her posture. The cure will be when the active contraction of her abdominal muscles is replaced by the passive condition of her abdominal muscles. She does not need to go all her life actively contracting those muscles, she just needs to change them so they're that way passively not just actively. What are the changes that she must undergo? The abdominal muscles, the rectus abdominis and external obliques need to get shorter. This is a diagram that just points out that muscles can get shorter. They can lose sarcomeres in series and become shorter. Muscles also change their stiffness and their stiffness is their passive resistance to elongation. There's an important property about stiffness. It's highly correlated with muscle size. So the larger it is, the stiffer it is. In this young girl, her problem was that her abdominal muscles were the least stiff and her hip flexors were too stiff. Not short, just stiff. It was a big spring. And what we needed to do to fix her was to make the abdominal muscles the stiff spring and the hip flexors, the least stiff spring. And stiffness comes from an intracellular protein called Titan. And Titan holds myosin on to the Z line in the sarcomere. And there are six Titan for every myosin filament. That means as a muscle hypertrophies, adds sarcomeres in parallel, it gets stiffer. This is a study that shows that if you look at muscle volume and correlate it with its passive stiffness, there's a very, very high correlation between the size of a muscle and its passive tension. 
So the general rule is that movement causing pain is not performed correctly and that what we need to do is to stop the movement that's causing the pain and make the adjoining segment move better. The secret to treatment, it's not a secret, the strategy for treatment is keep it stable. Here's the lumbar extension syndrome and I put up pictures of all these individuals. This first girl, this is a woman that has an extension syndrome, not because her hips are stiff, but because she's too flexible. She bends over much too easily. This one has an extension syndrome because of her kyphosis, and she's actually very stiff. This one has spinal stenosis. She has a problem with extension, as do all spinal stenosis patients. This was another gymnast with her knee flexed, She's in excessive lumbar extension because her rectus femoris is short, because her abdominals are not stiff enough. If they were stiff enough, her rectus femoris would not be short because her knee would flex without tilting her pelvis. And this woman, this is her ASIS, and she slides her hip into extension. She goes into an anterior pelvic tilt before she gets to the limit of the muscle length. As she slides her leg down, her pelvis continues to tilt. That observation cannot be related to muscle shortness, but to the relative stiffness. This individual, her pelvis doesn't tilt, but even though her hip flexor is short. And when we compare these, this will be the one with back pain. This one will not have back pain. It doesn't have to do with shortness. It has to do with the relative stiffness of the spine versus the lower extremity musculature. Another individual with a lumbar extension syndrome whose symptoms are eliminated by stopping the extension of her back. And a third case, a young man with very short hip flexors who's in lumbar extension and who could only extend his back because his pelvis doesn't posteriorly tilt. Now, the lumbar flexion syndromes are individuals who usually have overdeveloped abdominals. This is an ultramarathonist. He has a flat back and he's the man sitting in lumbar flexion. He's a competitive diver and when he bends over, he has excessive lumbar flexion even though his hips flex well. He's still in lumbar flexion, and he sits with his spine in lumbar flexion, contributed to by the overdevelopment of his abdominal muscles. And this is the ultramarathonist. When he bends over, he doesn't have excessive lumbar flexion, but he has a lack of hip flexion. He still needs to get his back out of the flexion that it's in, and he too sits in lumbar flexion. So in these individuals, their hip muscles are stiffer than their back muscles so that they flex instead of uh, flexing in the hips. So stretching a muscle, and I just want to make this point very strongly, stretching the muscle will not create, correct the back movement, but correcting the back movement will stretch the muscle. These are examples of rotation. The woman I showed you, this is a young man with a uh, shift, a, hurt, a, a radiculopathy, and she too has a radiculopathy. These are rotation problems. This, on this video, the woman that I showed you walking, you'll see that when I ask her to do hip lateral rotation, what she actually does is lumbopelvic rotation. Her thorax is staying still instead of confining the movement to her hip joint, she's rotating her pelvis. The treatment is to say, don't do that. <laughs> keep your hip, keep your pelvis still. I'll show you in just a minute. And just keep this still and just rotate in the hip joint. This is where the movement should be. And you'll see that it's difficult, but very doable. Similarly, in this woman, when we flex her knee and put her in a position for lumbopelvic rotation, as her hip rotates, so does her pelvis. So 
the, the point here is that in her back, she moves much too easily, and that's what's causing the tissue injury. So any movements of her hip are injuring her back. In this young man, who was scheduled for surgery for a herniated disc, you can see that he's uh, in a shift. If we put him on his hands and knees, you can see that his back is flexed and it's slightly rotated, higher on one side than the other. As he rocks back, instead of his hips flexing, his back flexes and rotates. We use that as a treatment. We don't let them go back, stop where it starts to flex, and after he got, and the idea is, I put this on here because you're using the facet joints to get rid of the rotation. The more they overlap, the more you get rid of the rotation. So immediately after the quadruped rocking, his alignment is much improved. He did not have to go to surgery. And this young woman had a radiculopathy. She had given birth to twins six months before she developed the back problem. And she too, when she was in hands and knees, rotated to the left. And it, she rotated to the left because the right iliopsoas was pulling more strongly than the left iliopsoas. When we had her rock back by pushing with her hands, the rotation did not occur. If we had her standing and put her right foot on a footstool so that we took the stretch off of the right iliopsoas, her alignment improved. The body was making the iliopsoas not work to keep from additional compression on the herniated disc. Okay. Muscul those are muscular factors contributing to the three syndromes. Now there are hip structural factors. I'm not sure what it's like in Spain, but in the United States, they're identifying a lot of structural abnormalities in the hip joint. They're called cam impingements and pincer impingements. And in the cam impingement, the head of the femur is too large, the neck too thick. I'll show you how this works. Beside these hip structural impairments of the head and neck, there's also femoral antiversion and retroversion. And when we're born, we have about 40 degrees of femoral antiversion that's supposed to decrease to uh, primarily by the time you're six to eight years of age and by the time you're 16 to only be 15 to 16 degrees. This is a girl with severe antiversion. And these are diagrams to depict this. Normal antiversion is 15 degrees. Abnormal is 35 degrees. In this hip, you will lack lateral rotation. Fem this is more common in women. Men have a tendency to have femoral retroversion, so their hip turns out a long way, but it doesn't turn in. A golfer can develop back pain or knee pain if he has femoral retroversion because his hips don't immediately rotate. A ballet dancer will get into trouble if she has femoral antiversion because her hips don't laterally rotate. Now the acetabular abnormalities, I mean, I'm sorry, femoral head neck abnormalities are pincer impingement where the head of the femur is too small for the acetabulum and then it hits on the front and on the back and the cam impingement in which the shaft and head are too big and they hit on the edge of the acetabulum. If you look at the epiphyseal lines, you see the difference in the normal hip. The epiphyseal line stops just beyond the edge of the acetabulum. In the abnormal hip, it extends way beyond the edge of the acetabulum. This is a young man that I saw after his surgery. He had hip pain. His mother was trying to force his hips to bend, and you see what happens, he got a fracture. They couldn't flex more than 90 degrees because of this very large femoral head and very thick neck. So they took him to surgery, and they cut down the head and the neck so he would not get new hips by the time he was 45 years of age. Another abnormality is acetabular retroversion, where the anterior wall of the acetabulum crosses over the posterior wall, which means that the anterior acetabulum is in the way of the femur when it flexes. 
This also will contribute to injuries in the hip joint. Now, I put this man up here because he's an individual that had back pain. He has a very flat back, and he flexes too much in the back because his hips don't flex. And the reason why they don't flex is because he had a cam impingement, and they cannot flex more than 90 degrees. So now we'll tell you about our research. We heard the, how important research is in physical therapy, and these are our examples of looking at these theories and these relationships. This is how we get our subjects all dressed up for the research. They get these little reflective markers on them, and then we have a six-camera system where we follow them, their movements in three dimensions. And this is uh, what they would look like with the little markers on them, and what we'll look at first is hip lateral rotation. And what we do is calculate the angle made by the, this doesn't, doesn't have any juice left. The, if you look at the angle alpha, that's the hip lateral rotation and the angle theta. We look at what happens to the pelvis as you laterally rotate the hip. And what, what we calculate is this is the hip joint motion and this is the pelvic motion. And we look at the difference between when they start. And the farther apart they are when they start, the better it is. Now, what have we found? That men and women with low back pain, that men had a greater percentage of their total lumbopelvic rotation at 60% of hip lateral rotation than women. So if you look at these two bars, when men with low back pain rotated their hip, their hip joint, their pelvis moved, and it was 50% of the total range with women, it was only 36% of their total range. Now, not only do men move their pelvis more than women during this test, but also they have more symptoms. So we looked at the patients that had an increase in their symptoms, which was about 43%, and those who had no increase in their symptoms. And what we found is that those with symptoms were more men than women and those who rotated their pelvis the most. In fact, 70% of the men had pain when they did hip lateral rotation, while only 36% of the women do. We believe this is a function of the stiffer musculature of the hips of men than of women. So, Compared to women, men performed a larger percentage of their lumbopelvic rotation, and it occurred earlier. A larger percent of the men had low back pain compared to women. Now, what we also did was take people with no low back pain and people with low back pain. And what you see here, that the hip rotation, uh, that when you laterally rotate your hip, it took longer for the pelvis to move in those without back pain compared to those with back pain. In other words, you move more readily if you have low back pain than if you don't have low back pain. The same was true for the knee flexion test. Now, importantly, this is anterior pelvic tilt, this is lumbopelvic motion, and this is the start of knee flexion. For anterior pelvic tilt, the people without back pain move just as readily as the people with back pain. But for pelvic rotation, there was a longer delay in the movement of the pelvis if you did not have back pain compared to if you do have back pain. So whether it's knee flexion or hip lateral rotation, you get movement of your lumbopelvic area more than those without back pain. What we also found in a study that's a randomized control trial, that if we had specific treatment for the patients, that though before treatment their pelvis moved more, after treatment it did not. Those that were treated nonspecifically still had a difference 
in their lumbopelvic rotation times. And, this, and all of this without any change in the amount of rotation of the hip joint itself. It's not a function of making the hip rotate better. It's a matter of keeping the pelvis still. So in summary, people with low back pain move the lumbopelvic region early during lumb lower limb motions. They have an altered movement pattern. Hip lateral rotation causes early lumbopelvic rotation, and knee flexion causes early lumbopelvic rotation. Training decreases the early motion. The effects of limb movements on low back pain. In other words, we're saying if you move your limbs, you get low back pain, but can we say if we stop the movement, the pain goes away? So in our exam, these are some of the tests. And what we found with tests such as knee extension in sitting, hip abduction lateral rotation, knee flexion, hip rotation, hip extension, that all of these tests, oh, 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 go back. Oh, there we go. All of these increase the symptoms. In 54 and 61 percent, hip rotation and hip extension increase the symptoms. None of these tests decrease the symptoms. But if we, uh, oh, uh, uh, one more point about this is that those people that had chronic back pain had a positive test with 67 percent of the tests those with only uh, an acute episode or first episode of low back pain, only 33% of them induced back pain. So this suggests a greater tendency for movement in the painful direction with a chronic condition, thus they're getting degenerative tissue changes. Here's the result of decreasing the movement of the back. If we stopped the movement of the back during the performance of these motions, these are the percentages. You can see almost everywhere from 77 to 93 percent of the people had a decrease or an elimination of their symptoms. And the range for those that stayed the same was from 23 percent to 8. So we can significantly stop the pain if we stop the motion in the back. Okay, and there's one other little point to all of this research is that during the hip lateral rotation test, we applied it to our back subgroups. I mentioned to you that we have a lumbar extension syndrome and we have a lumbar rotation syndrome and a rotation extension syndrome. In this particular part of the study, we compared the movement of the pelvis in patients with a rotation syndrome versus a rotation extension syndrome. And these are the, uh, what we think are important differences. That on the vertical axis is the onset is, is the timing when the pelvis started to move during hip lateral rotation with the right leg. This is when the pelvis started to move with hip rotation with the left leg. What this shows you in the patients that were classified as rotation patients, there was a high, high correlation, 0.94, which is a very high correlation, that shows you that the back behaved the same no matter which leg you moved. That would be consistent with having a symmetrical rotation problem. In the patients that were categorized as rotation extension, which were considered more asymmetrical, there was no correlation between movement of the right leg and when it started the pelvis to move and movement of the left leg so that these patients were very asymmetrical, which is just like the diagnosis was that we gave them. So this is the summary of the evidence that we have from our research studies examining our theories and examining our low back 
classifications. One, and I have not presented the evidence, but I could do that given enough time, we have reliability of our examination. Six of us, all trained, and we can perform the exam and get the same results. And that exam includes tests of trunk motion and limb motion. We have validity in classifying into these subgroups of extension, rotation, extension, rotation, and flexion. We know that movement of the limbs will cause back pain. We know that we can modify those limb movements and decrease or eliminate the symptoms. We have evidence that the relative stiffness causes an onset of lumbopelvic motion, and it's a very tiny motion, but it's significantly different in those that have back pain and those that don't have back pain. And I want to make the point again because it's so important to treatment. It's not about stretching any muscle. It's about preventing the back motion and stiffening the muscles that control the back rather than trying to stretch the muscles that cross the limbs. So, uh, and, and that's just what I have put on this slide too. So, the patient has to learn to move correctly and they must be instructed in that. So the treatment strategy, and we feel very confident in this strategy, we've completed a randomized control trial, and if the patient is taught to keep their back still, their, significant, their symptoms decrease. In fact, a very important finding of this study is that we gave patients treatment, six treatments. One, we didn't really give them treatments, we taught them what to do. They came in once a week for six weeks while we taught them what to do. Their symptoms decreased. They continued to decrease for six months, even though the treatment, the visits had stopped at six weeks. And it was all about stopping the movement in the lumbopelvic region. And you can tell if you're doing it right because their symptoms decrease. So the training for individuals is teaching them where to move, how much, and when they are contributing. So these are all the uh, collaborators on this research. We're all faculty at Washington University, and then graduate students, as well as some collaboration with investigators in Italy and Japan. So I thank you very much.